Asiatic schistosomiasis is a helminth infection of man and certain animals. It has long been prevalent in the Far East and in its advanced stages can be readily identified by the characteristic distended abdomen and emaciation of its victims. This disease is confined not only to native populations but presents definite dangers to the health of military personnel. It is caused by the blood fluke Schistosoma japonicum. In military circles, it is commonly called Schisto, snail fever, or by any one of a long list of local names. Other forms of this disease may be found in various parts of the world, but Asiatic Schistosomiasis is confined to the Orient. In Japan, there are five endemic centers in coastal river valleys. It is also found in parts of Formosa and the Philippines, and may also occur in the Celebes. The most extensive and severe endemic areas are in China. Our knowledge of the distribution of its intermediate snail host is incomplete. We do know it exceeds the known distribution of the disease. Endemic areas not heretofore recognized and possible new areas established by migrations or by infected troops should be watched for and reported. Man and certain animals serve as hosts in which the adult worms live. Mature eggs are passed in the feces. Primitive habits of sanitation are important factors in the spread of the disease. Human and animal pollution passes these eggs to the water in which they develop. The microscopic egg is oval to rounded and has a short lateral barb which may not be observed unless the egg is in the correct position. Only those eggs hatch which enter the water. They release tiny myricidia which are actively swimming organisms somewhat larger than the ova from which they emerge. They live for about 16 hours and are found in greatest numbers at or near the water's surface, where chances are best for encountering suitable snail hosts. The myricidia penetrate the fleshy portions of an appropriate snail, where they are transformed into sporocysts and migrate to the large digestive gland. Here the mother sporocyst produces 10 to 15 daughter sporocysts. These in turn produce large numbers of infective larvae called cercarii. They are released about five to seven weeks after penetration of the snail by myricidia. Since production by the daughter sporocyst is long and continuous, thousands of microscopic cercarii may result from one myricidium. These larvae move by crawling like a measuring worm and by swimming spirally and tail first. They live in water a maximum of 72 hours and therefore must encounter a suitable host within three days. When the tiny cercaria finds a mammalian skin surface, it penetrates rapidly by means of the anterior spines and histolytic secretions. Man exposes himself to infection by direct contact with polluted water. The native habits of using any available streams for washing themselves or their clothes aids in the spread of schisto. A single short contact with infected water may result in hundreds of cercarii penetrating the skin. A serviceman can become exposed in the line of duty. The cercarii can penetrate through his wet clothing. There is usually no immediate indication of infection. Itching may sometimes occur at the site of penetration, but its absence is no sign that the cercarii have missed.
petechiae resembling flea bites may develop at the site of cercarial penetration. They reach their maximum in 24 to 36 hours. Normally, unless the patient is re-exposed, this cercarial rash will disappear in three to four days and he will have no further symptoms until three or four weeks after infection. The cercarii are carried by the blood and lymph streams to the right side of the heart and thence to the pulmonary circulation where the larvae are delayed for several days while they squeeze through the capillaries into the veins. The larvae in the lungs produce transient areas of consolidation. In heavy infections, the lung lesions will have the appearance of diffuse hemorrhagic pneumonia. A few weeks following infection, the patient has afternoon fever, loss of appetite, a dry, hacking cough, and general malaise. The most conspicuous sign of this period, present in about half the cases, is the giant urticaria, which develops three to four weeks after infection. This symptom must not be confused with rash caused by other foreign protein intoxications. Pains develop in the back, epigastric region and legs or along nerve tracts. Nausea, vomiting and diarrhea may develop. Blood examination at this time shows a marked eosinophilia which frequently reaches 50% or more. From the lungs, the majority of the larvae are carried back to the heart. The course of the larvae can be followed from the heart to the arterioles and capillaries of the intestine, and from there to branches of the portal vein in the liver, where the worms lodge and grow to maturity. The mature males average about one and five tenths centimeters in length. They are broader and shorter than the females with ventrally infolded margins, forming a canal in which the more slender female lies during mating and egg laying. Here is the female fluke. The adult worms mate while still in the branches of the portal vein in the liver, and together they migrate against the bloodstream to the intestine. Here the female deposits her eggs in the venules of the intestinal mucosa, chain fashion laying them as she retreats with the blood current. Some eggs pass through to the lumen of the intestine without seriously injuring the tissues. Others provoke formation of abscesses. The typical schistosomiasis abscess consists of an egg or eggs surrounded by concentric layers of white cells. The abscess grows and slight pressure causes it to break through the intestinal epithelium, discharging its contents into the lumen of the gut. This first period, beginning with cercarial penetration and ending with the first appearance of eggs in the feces, lasts four to eight weeks. In addition to the former symptoms of daily fever, loss of appetite, and epigastric pain, there is dysentery with eggs in the stool. The patient loses weight in the second stage of the disease. The liver is somewhat enlarged, and the spleen may be palpable. At this stage, many eggs are being swept back in the bloodstream to the liver. In the liver, abscesses are produced singly or in groups to form larger lesions. The liver's attempt to encapsulate them results in replacement of hepatic tissue. Congestion of the spleen usually accompanies the liver damage. The blood picture is that of secondary anemia and at times leukopenia. 
During this second period, specific diagnosis can be readily established only by recovery of the eggs. Even without treatment, if the patient has had only a single light exposure, the disease may run a limited course since the eggs do not hatch in the body. His temperature will return to normal within three to 10 weeks. He will slowly recover his strength and he can return to duty. Unusual exertion may, however, cause a return of symptoms while the flukes remain alive in the body. In cases of extremely heavy infection or reinfection, there is great thickening of the intestinal wall due to repeated scar formation. This third stage of the infection is the period of tissue proliferation and repair. With this thickening, eggs do not escape into the lumen of the gut so readily. More and more of them are swept into the liver, serving as a factor producing cirrhosis. Enlargement of the liver and spleen is caused by circulatory congestion and a marked increase in the fibrous reticulum. When the liver becomes markedly cirrhotic, ascites and edema of the extremities may develop. In the late stage, eggs may be carried to the lungs, eye, or brain with resultant abscess formation in these organs. The patient may finally die of exhaustion or some terminal infection. Heavy infections, repeated infections, late diagnoses, and inadequate therapy are factors in an unfavorable prognosis. If the infection is allowed to progress, treatment is often of no avail due to the irreversible fibrotic changes of the liver, intestines, and other organs. With early treatment, however, complete cure is possible. Antimony compounds are the drugs of choice. If live eggs are found after completion of treatment, the course is repeated after a rest of two weeks. Since serious toxic symptoms may appear after their use, antimony preparations are contraindicated in the presence of cardiac, renal, or hepatic diseases. In their place, emetine hydrochloride may be used. This drug may not produce permanent cure. Iron is given for anemia, and patients should be given a high caloric diet. The addition of vitamin A and vitamin B complex is advised, together with such additional supportive therapy as the patient may require. Since the exact distribution of this infection is not known, it must be assumed that schistosomiasis is endemic until careful surveys have been made. A fair index of the importance of the disease can be found by examining stool specimens from the native population. Because they do not travel as much, children are more likely to have infections acquired locally. Stool specimens from them are a more positive indication of pollution within the area. OVA may be demonstrated in these specimens by several methods. One of the simplest is sedimentation with microscopic examination of the fecal specimen. Stool specimens from other animal hosts, such as dogs, cats, pigs, rats, and young water buffalo should also be examined for ova. Tissues should be examined for adult worms and other evidence of the disease. With military personnel, eosinophilia may be a useful index in screening for parasites, including schistosomes. Preliminary studies have been conducted in rat trapping as a method of discovering foci of infection.
Dissection of these rats was undertaken to discover whether they were schistosome hosts. Examination of the liver showed evidence of infection when compared with the liver of a normal healthy animal. Survey of suspected areas for infected snails should be routine procedure. Men should take every precaution against infection in this work. Boots must be worn when wading through the typical ponds, canals, and paddies where these snails are found. Even fast streams are potentially dangerous, since slow streams feeding them can be heavily infected with cercarii. Great care must be exercised in collecting snails. Hands must be kept dry. If they become wet, they should be dried immediately and swabbed with alcohol. Snails which are brought into the laboratory should be placed in wide mouth bottles in lots of about a dozen. A gauze top should be placed over the jars to prevent the snails from escaping. Each jar should be examined daily for escaping cercarii. It may be desirable to isolate the snails, once cercarii are demonstrated, in order to ascertain the source of cercarial production. Inactive cercarii are found in large numbers in the snail's digestive gland. Cercarii can also be demonstrated by crushing the snail. This is a more rapid technique, but the cercarii, when found, are immature. Schistosome cercarii are characterized by the presence of a forked tail. An idea of the size of the intermediate snail host species in the circle at the right can be had by comparing with the lead pencil. The small size is also apparent when they are placed on a dime. Since all field identification of snails is tentative, specimens preserved in 70% alcohol, together with collecting data, should be submitted through channels as part of the survey documentation. Preventive measures consist mainly of avoiding infection. For the protection of troops, all water for personal use should be chlorinated. Lister bags may easily be chlorinated by the addition of two calcium hypochlorite ampules. Remember, too, that since cercarii have a normal lifespan of 72 hours, water may be made schisto-free by allowing it to stand for a period longer than that. Boiling of water will also kill the cercarii. A most important step is the education of the natives to the point where they recognize the dangers of schisto and how it is spread. Improved native sanitation including the building of privies, is a necessary step in the elimination of this infection. Control of animals around bases is desirable. Military personnel should be warned by appropriate posters and notices of the locations of infected waters. Every precaution should be taken to prevent swimming, bathing, wading, or washing clothes in infected water. Schisto is contracted only by direct contact with the living cercarii in water. Remember that this organism is too small to be seen by the naked eye.
Remember, too, that all water except salt water in endemic areas is potentially dangerous. Control of the snail intermediate host is difficult and is of value only when carried out by trained personnel. The best insurance against this dangerous disease is the faithful observance of these simple rules. Keep out of water that has not been declared safe. If exposure is required in line of duty, adequate precautions must be taken. Use no water that has not been purified by chlorination, boiling, or storage for more than 72 hours. It is up to you to pass this word to your shipmates. Men who have licked the enemy have died of schisto.